but also the distribution of population within that area. If you look at England, 10% of England's population was in London. London was a huge and very filthy city. If you look at the German population distribution, very approximate, but in this period, there were essentially no cities over 60,000, and there were only a couple that hit 60,000. Uh, the majority of the urban places, officially, the Germanys had about 3,000 towns. 2,800 of those towns did not have more than 1,000 people in them. What distinguished them from villages was that they had city charters. Not that they had anything or, else, it was their government, their ability to self-govern. Uh, they were prominent local places. Uh, there were about 150 towns between 100 and 2,000. 1,000 and 2,000. Uh, the remainers had population, most 30 had, were between 2,000 and 10,000. <coughs> Uh, a town like Jena uh, was in that area, about 8,000 people in the university town of Jena, so close to where Granville arrived. And a town like Jena obviously had sanitation problems of very different dimensions from a city of 300,000 like Naples. It's a lot easier to keep the sanitation reasonably good when you have 8,000 people than when you have 300,000 people. It's just, for one thing, you know, getting it all carted up at night and hauled out uh, was much more manageable. Plus, Jena had, next to the city, a great big hill. And on top of the hill, it had a great big reservoir, like a water tower, that was filled by a creek. And every night after, the the night soil people had done their things. They opened the sluices, ran the water through the streets out into the river, and then closed Marsh. the sluices again to collect water for the next day, which meant that it was not anywhere near as mucky as smelly as, say, Edinburgh or Paris. So you just the, um, the, the levels of population you're dealing with. It was much more evenly distribu distributed in the Germans. They're going to have problems in the new Magdeburg. One of the things Same. that, um, as the series goes forward, um, downtimers are going to get very good at dealing with night soil. Um, because, and, and, and they're going, as, the, as the concept of the germ theory and epidemiology um, gets more distributed through the population, they're going to understand that there's some very simple things that they can do. Um, Francis Bacon, who had just died um, a few years before the Ring of Fire, described in his magnum opus um, what, it, what we now know as the deep, slow sand filter, which about 85% of all municipal utilities uh, in the world use to filter drinking water. The water treatment plant. Ba your basic water treatment plant. Um, the reason that it works is it's operated by gravity and the filter bed is like 10 feet deep or so. And what it does is it, it has the ability to filter out particulate down to the bacterial level. You can't filter out viruses because they're too small, but you can get down to uh, the the size of most bacteria. And you can filter them out. And that, which means so that also includes amoebas and and parasites. That's and correct on Giardia and things like that. Right. You don't even have to put chlorine in the water um, in most cases because of the fact that uh, this very non-high-tech means 
of filtering the water is available. And it, uh, it, it's going to be talked about a lot because the Grantville people knew about it. They had one, the, one of the things that goes back with Grantville is a working water treatment plant and a working wastewater treatment plant and a library because in both cases they had libraries of textbooks about water and wastewater treatment and they had two distinct laboratories that were able to do bacterial uh, and immunoassay uh, testing because they had several copies of a really cool book that it will put you to sleep almost immediately called Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater, which is, which is the Bible of the water and wastewater treatment industry. It tells you how to run a wastewater lab, how to run a water lab, um, and how to run a, an operating water treatment plant and wastewater treatment plant. The thing is that both of those technologies uh, to do both water and wastewater are well within the technological capability of downtimers without any help at all. All they have to know is that if you do this, this happens, and they'll be able to, and, and they'll be able to deal with it. Now, in the real, in the original timeline, it took a very long time uh, for us to figure out that that was what was working, and the reason was. Um, we did not know until the mid to late uh, 19th century that um, bacteria um, and amoebas and waterborne and other waterborne pests were what was causing most disease. Um, we did not know until Pasteur's swan necked alembic experiment, which, by the way, is still going on. Over a hundred years after Pasteur's death, there is still nothing growing in that alembic um, mm. because uh, of, because of the fact that it was pasteurized, it was clean, and there's no way into it. And there's, there's no other, yeah, no the, other intro introduction. There, and, and so, if you want to know about how the, how the theory of disease, um, the germ theory of disease, was proven, that's it, and it goes on every day proving it. In the, in the early part of the middle of the 19th century, people were starting to, re, to realize that in hospitals, if you sprayed carbolic acid all over everything, mm -hmm. which was available then, that people stopped dying of gangrene. Um, and um, in the US Civil War, for example, um, the survival rate from amputations of major limbs, um, arm cut off here, leg cut off at the hip, was less than 70%. So three or four out of 10 people that made it to the, the, to, medic. To, to the medic tent, um, the sawbones killed them, uh, basically, by cutting their limbs off and introducing gangrene. Um, it was not until a major cholera epidemic occurred in London that people began to figure out uh, what became uh, the science of epidemiology. How many of you have ever heard of the Broad Street Pump? I think I've heard of it. Okay. The Broad Street Pump was one of the, was considered the best source of water in central London. Clean. Clean water. Almost everybody in central London who, who weren't living in a palace or something like that where they had some piped in water was getting their water from the, from the Broad Street pump, which had, a, uh, which had a shallow draft well. In other words, the well was, uh, the, 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 the aquifer that the well was drawing from was very close to the surface, so if I remember correctly, and I might be wrong, it was on the order of 12 to 15 feet. Well, it has to be above the level where the Thames comes in and out on the tide. That's right. So the, the Broad Street pump was actually, you know, less than a story below ground. Um, this was in the days when if you rented a house in London, 
one of the clauses in the rental agreement said that you promised to return the house without any shit in the basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, serious. Seriously. Because what people did was they crapped in the in the chamber pot and then they took the chamber pot downstairs and emptied it into the basement. And when they filled that up, they hired people to come in and muck all that stuff out and they sold all that muck to the tanners and dyers and fullers. Um, because um, you get ammonia and other chemicals from it. Uh, and there were whole groups of people, that was their occupation, was to go around picking raking up- Raking the muck. Pick, <laughs> yeah, raking the muck, they were muck rakers. The term um, honey wagon came along? The, the honey wagon, uh, the, the night soil wagon, was a feature of, the early, of early modern Europe. Uh, because what, would, what they would do is they would come along and collect the night soil and then they would then they would cart it into town and sell it uh, to the tanners and the dyers uh, and the fullers. So that it didn't all just end up in the street, so people aren't just emptying the bucket That's out right. the window. That's and that, and, and like, like Virginia was talking about, that was Jana? Yeah. Yeah. That had the, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so the night soil people would come along and collect it, take it to the, to the quarter of the city where all the bad smells were, um, and then they would flush the streets. London couldn't do that because London is in a tidal flat. And there's no could, downhill. There's no downhill in uh, London. Um, what happened was um, there was a it, it, there was a single family which acquired cholera from drinking bad water, and the cholera was passed to about 1,500 people who died, and they discovered that the bad water had come from the fact that there was one of these basements that was leaking into the, uh, into the aquifer that the Broad Street pump was pulling water from. And when they discovered that, about 20 years later, they realized that they had invented the science of epidemiology. Um, Tim? Yeah, that, that's Dr. Snow. Right. Um, and I'd like to add, there was a very big paradigm in play throughout Europe and England for the miasma theory. Mm -hmm. The disease is caused by bad smells, a miasma. And if you don't live near bad smells, you won't get you sick. You won't get sick. And only poor people live near bad smells. And poor people are, the other thing, of course, was that poor people are poor because God is mad at them. Mm -hmm. And that's how the base is Because they deserve um, to be poor. And yeah. if, you, if you talk to and the you U.S. Or if, if, you, if you talk to the U.S. investment banking community to this day, they will tell you that that's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things, um, uh, the other thing that, I don't know if we're going to say this, uh, Dr. Snow noticed that the people working in a brewery in the middle of this epidemic weren't getting sick. Yes. And the brewery had a very deep well, an artesian well they used to make their beer they would give their workers, pay them partially in beer, and they would allow them to take water from the well mm -hmm. back home. So they were drinking the water. Or them. washing in it. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the things that sparked mm -hmm. in Dr. Snow's head as he wandered around. One of the things that's going to be real interesting is um, the reason there was no cholera, or probable reason for the fact that there was no cholera in early modern Europe, was likely because um, the people who get cholera. Everybody, does anybody know what cholera does? Everybody know what it does? It, it, it's, it's basically a, 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 a